Welcome everyone to the Major General Sohan Lal Bhatia Oration Memorial for 2021. I am Radhika Hegde from the History of Medicine Department at St. John's Medical College, Bengaluru. It is my pleasure and a privilege to introduce you to the oration. It has truly been an honor curating Dr. Bhatia's personal archives. His correspondences and speeches reflect the challenges and achievements of his extraordinary life as a doctor and an administrator. An astute thinker and a prolific writer, Bhatia covers, Bhatia's work covers a range of subjects from his research in physiology to that of his comments on the state of medical education in India and his reflections on world history, history of medicine, ethics, and humanities. Born in 1891 in Punjab, Sohanlal Bhatia finished his early schooling in Lahore, where his father was a well-known surgeon. In 1910, he went to Cambridge for his medical education. It was there that he met Dr. A. V. Hill, professor of physiology and later a Nobel laureate. Hill and Bhatia found many points of common interest and formed a close personal friendship built on mutual respect and later exchanges that lasted until his death in 1977. With the outbreak of the First World War in 1914, young Sohan Lal worked as a surgical dresser on the hospital ship, the Guilford Castle. He then joined the Indian Medical Service in 1970 and distinguished himself as a regimental officer to the 105th Maratha Light Infantry, known as Kali Panchmi in Palestine and Syria, and was the first Indian officer to receive the Medical Cross for his exemplary courage. He was appointed as a professor of physiology and hygiene in the Grant Medical College, where he later became the first Indian dean, a post that he held until 1941. After 1947, Dr. Bhatia committed himself to the vision of the newly independent India in helping to improve the health services across the country. When the government of India called upon Dr. Bhatia to reorganize the medical services in Hyderabad in the 1950s, he readily accepted the position and in a matter of three years expanded the medical service there. He also took interest in improving the existing center of the indigenous system of medicine as he strongly believed in the unity of medicine. One of his most important contributions was his role as the chairman of the Pharmaceutical Inquiry Committee set up by the government of India in 1953. The report was a roadmap that chalked India's complete independence in pharmaceutical drugs and also recommended more research in the indigenous system of medicine. After his retirement in 1954, he settled in Bombay, he settled in Bangalore where he pursued his lifelong interest in the history of medicine, especially in understanding the literature on the traditional system of medicine in India. He continued to serve the field of health in various capacities by providing his input for the improvement of medical education and hospitals. It was at this time that he came to know about St. John's Medical College from the then Dean Dr. Louis Montero. The setting up of the department of the history of medicine in the medical college was an idea conceived by the dean and the management invited Major General Bhatia to be its first emeritus professor. The Museum of History of Medicine was set up in 1974, primarily built on Bhatia's collections and sustained through his generous deed of property at Banjara Hill in Hyderabad. While we celebrate Gandhi Jayanti tomorrow, let's remember the way Mahatma's values left a mark in the lives of individuals like Bhatia, who truly lived by the principles of peace, humility, and regarding mankind as one family. A scientist, a doctor, an administrator, and above all a humanist, Bhatia truly touched the lives of men. Welcome to the Bhatia Oration. Before we go further, uh, I would uh, like to announce that uh, this is an oration. So we will not have a Q&A session. However, the comments box is, uh, box is open and uh, you can, the chat box is open and you can actually uh, 
putting your comments there. I would uh, now like to call upon Dr. Josh, the Dean of the Medical College, uh, to introduce Dr. Dagmar Bolasti. Thank you. Uh, good evening, and uh, it's my privilege to introduce today's orator for the Major General Bhatia Oration, Dr. Dagmar. She is an associate professor at the University of Alberta in the Department of History and Classics and Religious Studies. She is an Indo Indologist specializing in the history and literature of classical South Asia including Indian medicine, that is Ayurveda, iatrochemistry, and yoga. She has published extensively in classical Ayurveda. She is the editor of a special volume of the Asiatic student at today's Asiaticus, entitled Histories of Mercury in Medicine Across Asia and Beyond, a special volume of History of Science in South Asia, entitled Transmutations, Regeneration, Rejuvenation, Longevity and Immortality Practices in South and Inner Asia, and Associate Editor of the Journal of Asian Medicine. In 2015, Professor Dagmar received the European Research Council Horizon 2020 Award to head a research team to work on entangled histories of yoga, medicine, and alchemy in medieval India. Today, Dr. Dagmar will be speaking to us on reconstructing the Indian alchemical tradition, text and practice. Over to you, Dr. Dagmar. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Uh, I'm honored to have been invited uh, to give this year's uh, Major General S.L. Bhatia Memorial Oration, and I would like to warmly thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, so today I would like to talk about uh, some of the aims and outcomes of my research project called Ayur Yog, uh, which was this five year research project uh, funded by the European Research Council um, at the University of Vienna in Austria and also at the University of Alberta in Canada on the entangled histories of yoga, Ayurveda and Rasa Shastra, so the Indian alchemical and iatrochemical traditions. The project formally concluded last year, but we still have been finalizing some of our work with some publications still forthcoming. So in the course of the project, it became clear that our audiences, both scholarly and the wider public, had different degrees of familiarity with our subjects of study. Everyone in the world has heard of yoga, of course, and increasingly, though to a much lesser degree, also um, uh, people have become aware of Ayurveda, of Indian medicine. However, on the topic of Rasa Shastra or Rasavada, so Indian alchemical and iatrochemical traditions, we usually draw a blank with our global audiences. People outside of India have basically never heard of it. Even scholars of the history of alchemy and medicine are only faintly aware of this discipline and its literary heritage due to a paucity of secondary literature on it. Of course, in India, there's more awareness, uh, especially given that some of the medical aspects of Rasa Shastra survive as part of formal Ayurvedic education and therefore practice, and also play a role in the Indian pharmaceutical industry. So, for example, in India, for those who are maybe not so familiar with the uh, Rasa Shastra, you may come across medicines uh, such as um, Makaradvaj, uh, which is um, a stimulant or a vitalizer that is widely distributed. Um, so a pharmaceutical product that may be categorized as a uh, Rasa Shastra product, though it would be marketed as an Ayurvedic medicine. First recipes for Makaradvaj are found in alchemical works, in Rasa Shastra works, such as the Rasa Ratnakara, the Anandakanna, and the Rasa Manjari. So this recipe for this particular medicine goes back to something like the 13th century. And while the modern formulations of Makaratvaj may have introduced some changes to the original formula, 
the general methods and procedures for processing the substances, and in this case, it's mercury and sulfur, but also gold, uh, will still have been broadly followed. Of course, knowing that something exists doesn't equate knowing about its history. And indeed, when it comes to the history of Rasa Shastra, very few are aware of the very long history of the discipline, its large body of literature, which goes back at least a thousand years, and its contribution to Indian cultural, religious, and scientific history. So for the last period of the Ayuryoga project, we decided to focus on Rasa Shastra and to create some materials that would give an overview of the tradition and its history. And we did this in three different ways. First, we created an interactive timeline of Rasa Shastra literature. Second, we assembled a reader in Rasa Shastra, a reader in Indian alchemy. So these are translation, um, translations of excerpts from the Sanskrit alchemical works. And third, we recreated or reconstructed recipes or formulations from the Sanskrit alchemical works. And we documented these in videos and accompanied the videos with explanatory blog posts. With this, we hope to address both scholarly and non-scholarly audiences to create more awareness of the subject among academics and in the general public, and to furnish historians with didactic materials that they can use for teaching or for just informing themselves. So let me begin by showing you our timeline of Rasa Shastra. And for that, I need to share my screen. So let's hope this goes easily. There we go. I hope everybody can uh, see this screen. Yes, so here we are. See. You can see this, that's good. So uh, what you can see here is my project website, the Ayuryog website. And so uh, this will be the, the uh, main page and so on. And I'm now on the page here, Alchemy Timeline. So if you click on that, this is the image that you get to, and that's sort of the beginning of our timeline. This um, timeline, this interactive timeline was curated by Dr. Patricia Saltoff, who was a postdoctoral research fellow on my project and myself. So um, as you can see, uh, we call this timeline Rasa Shastra, a timeline of Sanskrit alchemical literature rather than a timeline of Indian alchemy or Indian natural chemistry. Uh, this is for the reason that um, the sources um, we used for this timeline are all Sanskrit sources. So we did include a few English sources for the 20th century, uh, but even these are all based on Sanskrit Rasa Shastra literature. So this timeline does not give a comprehensive overview of all kinds of alchemy or early chemistry or yatra chemistry um, that developed on the Indian subcontinent. Uh, so for example, the Tamil Siddha tradition and its very significant body of literature is not recorded here and neither are the Persian sources or sources in other Indic vernaculars. Indeed, the timeline does not even cover all known Sanskrit Rasa Shastra works, but just those that we have a reasonable amount of information on. And as more works become known and become available, we may be able to fill in the gaps. So let's have a look at how this works. Um, so you need to scroll down to get to this um, panel that shows you the times. And so here you can see there are folders with different works and you can sort of move back and forth in uh, the timeline by just going to a particular folder or otherwise you can just use this arrow to just go one page um, ahead at a time. Now we um, debated um, where to start with this timeline. So should we start with first mentions of Rasa Shastra or Rasa Vada or Dhatu Vada, another word that is relevant here in Indian literatures. So for example, there is a mention of a practitioner of alchemy in the uh, in Banabhattas Kadambari of the seventh century. Well, there's a depiction of alchemists in Udyotana Suri's Kovalaya Mala from the eighth century. So both are plays in, in narrative literatures. And there are other sources as well that, that give us a glimpse of um, the existence of an alchemical practice in India uh, before the actual emergence of its own literature. So, however, we decided uh, to start with texts that describe alchemical and yatrochemical practice from the inside, as it were. So Rasa Shastra literature proper, in the sense of a literature that describes a formalized discipline, begins with the Rasa Hridaya Tantra, the heart of Mercury. This is a work that dates to about the 10th century. 
However, there is one text that stands outside the immediate tradition, but that describes strikingly advanced alchemical procedures, and here it is. Um, uh, this is the Kalyana Karaka, which is a giant medical work, and this work describes uh, very advanced alchemical procedures using technical terms that become the standard in later alchemical works. Uh, so um, there are some open questions about the dating of this work, and indeed the position of the chapter uh, that deals with alchemical procedures. So it is possible that its position right at the beginning of uh, this alchemical timeline is not quite right. So some say it should actually be put to the 13th century. And indeed, as with so many works in Sanskrit, there is a certain amount of uncertainty uh, uh, with the dating for all of the alchemical works, uh, though their relation to each other, so which work came first, uh, which followed and so on, is somewhat less uncertain. So you have to take these selected time periods with a bit of a pinch of salt. I mean, there may be some errors even by a century. Of course, the dates are not randomly chosen. Um, uh, we have followed the dates given in Jan Gerrit Mellenbelt's History of Indian Medical Literature. And in his work of 30 years of research into these, uh, these texts, Mellenbelt provides an overview of the different academic discussions concerning the date of each work and the reasons for the suggestions, and then himself comes to a conclusion, though often the conclusion covers quite a large time period. So if you scroll down and you see, uh, for example, here the Rasahriya time you can see that there's a, a basically a century uh, listed here because we don't have an exact date for the formulation and some even some works uh, even cover two or three centuries like the Rasaratnakara where um, the the five volumes uh, the five books of the Rasaratnakara may have been written over uh, several centuries at different times. So I will not guide you through every entry of this timeline because there are 93 entries to date. So these are not 93 works, but um, each work gets uh, several entries. Uh, but I would like to show you one example, namely the Rasahridaya Tantra. So for that, I would like to go forward a little bit just so to give you an idea of what each entry uh, looks like. So the Rasahridaya Tantra, the, the uh, heart of Mercury, is the oldest work of the genre. And on the first page of each entry, uh, you will find a synopsis of the work. And this is usually based on Merlin Belt's summary in his History of Indian Medical Literature with some additions or corrections by us uh, that are informed by our readings of the original Sanskrit texts. So I would like to just note that the images, the background images in this timeline are very often images taken by Mr. Andrew Mason, um, who I will speak about uh, a little bit later again. Um, and these images were taken in the course of the Rasa Shastra experiments, these recreation of, of recipes uh, that we conducted together. So moving on a page, so you have this synopsis, a little summary of the contents of the work. And then if you go one page on, uh, you will find uh, translations of verses. In this case, we have done several pages uh, with translations uh, of uh, short excerpts, and you will always find where, who translated it or where we have this translation from at the, uh, the bottom. Um, uh, so um, I should mention that, of course, um, the function of these excerpts is not so much to give you deep insight into the topics of the work, that's impossible to convey in just a few verses, but rather to showcase some interesting passages that bring up some common themes in this literature and that might elicit further interest. As you may have seen just earlier uh, in uh, two pages uh, before, sometimes we have added some videos here. Uh, so this is one of our reconstruction videos. Some of the entries also contain videos of interviews that we conducted for the translators of some of the texts where they talk about the various texts. So we try to give a sort of diverse insight into this literature through this um, timeline. And then the final entry for each work, not every one, but almost all of the works that we have is a map that um, shows where one can find manuscript copies of uh, the work. 
Um, so these maps were made by Dr. Keith Kantu for the IUO project. They're a bit small here, but if you go to the very back of the timeline to the very end, we have um, um, them all listed there. And then you can find larger images. So if I just change over here, this is what the larger images at the back look like that you can click on. So here you can see where there are still extant manuscript copies of the work, in this case, the Rasa Hridaya Tantra. So you can see that there's a relatively small number of uh, uh, manuscripts there, but some of the um, alchemical works have slightly larger numbers, though never as many as you would find, uh, for example, for um, the Ayurvedic works, like um, the Ashtanga Hridaya Samhita, for example, you actually have hundreds of thousands of manuscripts. So the number here for the alchemical works is rather lower. So we can note that the Rasa Shastra works, and let me just go maybe for one, just for you to see a few um, extra works. So the Rasarnava is also a very important work of the um, tradition. Well, we can note that the earliest Rasa Shastra works are presented as describing techniques for making elixirs or tonics or medicines for attaining spiritual aims, specifically the transcendent aim of Jivan Mukti or liberation in the living body. But quite soon, from the Rasendra Chudamani onwards, we can see a heightened emphasis on the pharmacological aspects and medical treatments in these works. Um, uh, so using procedures, however, for processing substances first introduced in the oldest works in the context of elixir making. So there's a general shift from alchemy to yatrochemistry or chemical medicine and a reinterpretation what Rasa Shastra is for, while the methods and procedures of the original works are retained. So one thing I would still like to show you here on this is, um, oh, if I can actually make it work, yes, there we go, is that there is a gap in between the works. So if you look at this panel, you can see there's many, many works here. Um, but if we go further, you can see that there is a gap starting around 1650 with the Ayurveda Prakasha being the last work, and then up to 1900 when the first English language works uh, uh, appear. So, um, so this is between the middle of the 17th and the beginning of the 20th century. And it seems that during this period, hardly any Sanskrit works on alchemy were produced. Though, of course, there's always the possibility of new finds of works that we simply haven't been able to consider yet. We know of some works written in that period in Sanskrit, but really very few. And we think this was a period in which vernacular literary production took over. But this period certainly deserves more attention and is something that we would like to work on in future. In any case, in the 20th century, there was a renaissance of works on Rasa Shastra, with first works written in English, such as the famous history of uh, Hindu chemistry, uh, by P.C. Uh, Rai, um, but also the first print editions of Rasa Shastra works appearing, so the, the Sanskrit uh, manuscripts being brought out as, as print publications, the first editions of these works. Uh, there some important names are, are uh, Trikamji Acharya, and actually even new works appearing in Sanskrit. Uh, so there, for example, a famous work would be again Trikamji Acharya's Rasamrita. So this is a work that is still used for Rasa Shastra education in, in colleges and universities even today. Now, this was not the end of Rasa Shastra literature. You can see we end here with the Rasa Jala Nidhi, so we're in the 1930s. And that doesn't really signify the end of this literature at all. Uh, new works are still being written today and very often in the context of Ayurvedic education. So there are new textbooks. And there's also a different genre of writing on Rasa Shastra, namely reports on medical studies on Rasa Shastra pharmaceutical products. And uh, these are just not uh, featured here. So let me stop my share there for a little bit. So it is time to look at our second output, namely the Indian alchemy reader or the reader in Rasa Shastra, we haven't quite decided on the title yet, which is an edited volume with a group of contributors. So this is a work that is still in progress, which I very much hope will be published next year. 
so I can't show you a nice finished product and a published book at the moment, but I can tell you there will be 12 chapters, each based on a different Sanskrit alchemical work. And this volume will draw on a selection of the most important Sanskrit alchemical works from the 10th to the 17th centuries. So the book will provide a broad introduction to Indian alchemy and yatra chemistry, tracing and explaining alchemical and chemical protochemical thought in the Sanskritic tradition as it developed on the Indian subcontinent. Each chapter consists of two parts, uh, an introduction and then a translation of an excerpt from an alchemical work. The selected uh, excerpts are typically full chapters to reveal the characteristic style of each work. And this is something that we could not do for the timeline where we could only translate a couple of verses at a time. So here in this translation, we really uh, hope to uh, convey a feel of, of uh, this kind of literature and the kinds of themes introduced in them. So each chapter also represents um, the most common themes that you find in this uh, literature. So each introduction presents the selected alchemical work and its position within Sanskrit alchemical literature because works quote from each other. They form a kind of lineage of knowledge. This is why we can talk of a tradition in the first place because they all refer to each other and are as of one piece as it were. The, the um, introduction also situates, uh, situates the translated chapter uh, within the alchemical works structure and outlook. So of course, uh, even if you just take one, uh, if you take one chapter, it, uh, it may be somewhat misleading if uh, all the other chapters are about completely different topics. So uh, how this chapter functions within the wider work is also discussed. And then an introduction also provides a discussion of the general themes that are introduced in the chapter and how they represent or are unusual for Sanskrit alchemical thought. So for example, we have one uh, chapter on alchemical pilgrimage where um, a journey to Sri Shailam is uh, described and various actions that that alchemists or the pilgrims should take uh, in that place. And actually, this is a very unusual theme for alchemical literature. It only occurs in two of the alchemical works, but we wanted to introduce it. And then finally, um, uh, the book will also highlight connections to other disciplines such as Ayurveda and yoga and broader Indic uh, thought in general. So this volume will provide didactic materials for courses on the subject, but it is also directed at the wider public and anyone who might be interested. We have interviews with the contributors to the volume speaking about the works and the subjects their chapters cover. And again, um, you can find this on our website, slightly hidden. And uh, let me share my screen once uh, more for this. So if you go back to the website, um, Sorry, I have to find the right one. So if you see here, you go to resources and then under resources, you find Untangling Traditions, which was a conference that we did. And if you scroll down to um, uh, the Alchemy Reader, you will find various videos with interviews and a little uh, um, a summary of the person who translated. So in this case, Dr. Priyanka Chorge, who is an Ayurvedic doctor in Hamburg, um, and uh, she has a, she uh, studied uh, Rasa Shastra at Pune. Uh, so she has a BAMS, and uh, she and I together translated a, trans, uh, a chapter from the Rasa Ratna Samuchaya, uh, which has a very big um, medical part, and we chapter uh, we um, translated the chapter on Udara. So here you can find. Um, her um, her chapter. So let me unshare again. Okay, so finally, uh, and I would encourage you to go through the interviews just to get a sense of what kind of chapters, what kind of themes we will be covering uh, with this work. So finally, let me introduce you to the third part of our work on Rasa Shastra, namely the videos showing our recreations of alchemical formulae from the alchemical works. And for this, actually, I do need to share my screen one last time. So there we go. Um, so you will be able to find, so if we just go to the main page of the website, um, you will find these um, uh, videos for the alchemical reconstruction here under alchemy reconstruction. 
So this was a collaboration between myself and Andrew Mason, who had studied Rasa Shastra, also Ayurveda, um, in Sri Lanka. So he had some relevant training in the subject. Andrew and I made two separate series, and you can find them on our website just here. Um, so as you can see here, it begins with uh, series two, but if you scroll down all the way down, you can find uh, series one, which is where we um, began. And you can see we actually did quite a, a lot of uh, videos on the subject. Um, so the first of the uh, series of videos showed the first eight of these so-called sanskaras. Uh, so these are procedures for cleansing and potentiating mercury. And this is part of 18 standard steps for making and administering mercurial elixirs. And this is one of the uh, truly central themes of Sanskrit alchemical literature. So in series one, we uh, followed instructions from the Rasa Hridaya Tantra, the heart of Mercury, the oldest of the alchemical works dating to probably the 10th century, maybe a little bit earlier. And in each film, we show the relevant verse um, uh, from the Rasa Hridaya Tantra, our translation, and then our interpretation of what the procedure entailed. The motivation for making these reconstructions or recreations stemmed from a wish to see the descriptions of the text come to life, uh, to get a sense of why the text uses its specific language and technical terms in particular. So the, the Rasa Hridaya and also the later text describes what happens in these sanskaras, in these procedures with terms like sweating mercury, making mercury faint, uh, raising mercury, binding it, or even killing it. So this really brought up the question for me, just reading these texts as a philologist, what were alchemists seeing that made them use these extraordinary terms? And other questions we were pursuing included the basic but still foundational question, what was the text for? Why did these texts emerge in the 10th century? Alchemy had existed for a long time before. So why were these texts now being written and why were they written in Sanskrit? Was, was such a text meant to be a manual for alchemists or did it have a different function? So doing these replications, and I'm sorry not to be able to show you the video right now, but I think this would probably be a bit disruptive and they're quite long, um, but doing these replications showed us quite quickly that it would be impossible to practice alchemy on the basis of using the text alone. Clearly you needed a lot of prior knowledge in terms of ingredients, instruments, but particularly methods. This was not a do-it-yourself manual, but rather a concise overview of the methods alchemists used and the sequences of their procedures. So in other words, the earliest texts were about establishing the alchemical craft or the craft of Rasa Shastra as a Shastra, an authoritative discipline with a circumscribed body of knowledge. We can therefore perhaps understand the emergence of this literature as a kind of early professionalization process. Now, one of the things we came up against in the first series was that we couldn't really decide whether we had done the procedures right, because there was no way of testing this. We did up to step eight, but the final product would really be tested in step 18, you know, it's 18 steps altogether, and 17 would be the sort of moment of truth, uh, because you would apply the elixir to um, transmuting gold and silver. Um, so uh, we stopped at eight, and these were quite difficult to reconstruct, there was so much doubt about the materials and the methods at each step, so with each variable, it really meant that we were very unsure of ourselves, whether we had indeed recreated the recipes or just created a very poor reflection of what it should have been. So that's why we decided to make a second series using a later text, the Rasa Prakasha uh, Sudhakara, which is a 16th century, well, probably 16th century text. So quite a late text in the, um, in the tradition, if you remember the gap that happens uh, around that time. Um, so this is a text that is mostly medical in outlook, but it also has a chapter on making artificial coral, artificial pearls, gold and silver. Um, and usually it describes it as making something that looks like gold or looks like silver. And in some cases it says it actually is making gold or making silver. So it was very uh, interesting to recreate the recipes and our hope was that we would see 
did what we had created look like gold or silver or like coral or like pearls or did it not? Um, I would say we were semi-successful in this. Uh, some products uh, clearly looked more convincing um, than others. So let me just scroll up and you can see uh, the videos uh, for making the things. So here, for example, you can see the pearls made out of fish eyes. And here you can see the coral made out of cinnabar and conch shell. So quite uh, simple recipes in some cases. And, and these outcomes, the pearls and the corals, uh, coral was probably our most successful um, outcome. And we made brass that looked a bit like gold. Um, but certainly, um, it was uh, the series was similar to our first series in that clearly the recipes don't tell you all you need to know. In some recipes, we thought a line or two might be missing in the Sanskrit text um, because there were some internal inconsistencies. And some experiments did not yield anything that could be considered a success at all. Um, so I'm just thinking in particular in some of the um, silver making. So here you can see the outcome for one of the silver making ones. Uh, and it's arguable, you can argue about whether this is successful or not, because one of the things is we don't quite know what the um, alchemists in the 16th or 17th century were actually looking for, and they don't tell us how they used the final product. Now we discuss every recipe that we recreated in blog posts. So if you just uh, go to the blog here on the website, you can find uh, um, an accompanying blog for each of the films. And I've also put the links usually here, right next to the video. You can also find uh, all of our videos, including um, all of our interviews and conference proceedings and so on, um, on the Ayurveda YouTube site. So for that, you just need to Google or do a search for the Ayurveda project on YouTube. So there are quite a few different Ayur Yog um, sites out there. So um, sorry again that I can't show you all these uh, videos, but in your own time, I would encourage you to have a look at them and see what you think of our recreations. Um, I would like to end the, um, uh, with this thought, and I realize I'm a little bit faster than I thought I would be, but um, I would like to end with this thought, um, basically that there is so much still to do to uncover the fascinating history of the Rasa Shastra tradition, and even more for the wider Indian alchemical and yetrochemical traditions like the Tamil Siddha tradition, which has not received much attention as a historical subject yet, partly due to the problems of, of translation um, with these very complicated uh, texts. Some may say, that Rasa Shastra, that Indian alchemy and yetrochemistry is a very esoteric or fringe subject, but I would counter that the sheer size of literary production in this discipline and the fact that a substantial part of it survives to this day shows it on the contrary to be a subject of significant historical and cultural interest. I hope my project's endeavors help to put uh, Rasa Shastra on the map, as it were, uh, both for those interested in Indian history and those interested in global histories of medicine, science, and technology. Thank you for listening. I'm sorry, I was a bit faster than I thought I would be. Well, that was wonderful, Professor Dagmar Wajutstik. Thank you, you took us on such a fascinating journey through the traditions of Indian alchemy and opened the doors to your extensive research in this area. It was actually like a tickler or a trailer wanting us to know more. Thank you for that valuable website and we look forward to your upcoming book. Your knowledge is truly vast and definitely humbling. Thank you for making time at 8 a.m. your time in Canada to deliver this oration and honor the memory of Major General S.L. Bhatia, who was committed to bringing all streams of medicine into research and education. Truly, thank you very much. I now call upon Reverend Dr. Charles Davis, the Associate Director of St. John's Medical College and Research Institute, to hand over to Dr. Dagmar Vajustik a token of our appreciation.
before I present the certificate of appreciation to Dr. Dutmer, I'd like to say a few words of appreciation. It is really amazing that you, a person from the West, not just doing that in-depth research in the Ayurvedic traditions, but for the very fact of even pronouncing the words in Sanskrit, such as Rasahirdiya uh, Tantra, and uh, Sasruta Samkhita and Charaka Samhita and so Excellent. This is an example of invitation and inspiration to do in-depth research. Research is not something that we do it just for sake of doing it, but doing it to revive the tradition that lives in the past, that we give life to that past in the present. I'm extremely impressed by the way that you are doing the research. And I'd like to only congratulate you for this excellent work that you are doing. And uh, it is really fitting that we have such a great eminent scholar like you to have delivered for us for this uh, major general party memorial oration. Thank you so much. Yeah. So here is the certificate of appreciation to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. So finally, on behalf of St. John's National Academy of Health Sciences, I, Manjuli Kavaz, from the Division of Health and Humanities, have the privilege to deliver today's vote of thanks. Thank you once again, Dr. Dagmar. Thank you, Dr. Dagmar, for delivering today's wonderful oration. Thank you, Father Charles, for making time to be here with us today and share that note of inspiration. Thank you, Dr. George, the Dean of St. John's Medical College, for being with us and for introducing the orator for the evening. Thank you, Dr. Tony, Dean of St. John's Research Institute, for all your support in organizing today's event and for support to the museum and the humanities division. This oration, thanks to Dr. Bhatia's bequest of his property to St. John's, is an annual institutional event. The Department of the History of Medicine remains the first and only endowed department in the college. Professor Bhatia also endowed St. John's with his lifetime collection of books, papers, and pictures related to the history of medicine. Online events have a lot of back-end work, and today's oration would not have been a grand success without the hard work of the IT team at St. John's Research Institute, especially Mr. Maharaj, Mr. Anthony, and Mr. Sharath. Last but not least, we thank all of you for making the time for being here at this oration and honoring the memory of Major General S.L. Bhatia. A happy Ganesh Sorry, a happy Gandhi Jayanti to all of you. Jai Hind. Namaskara. Thank you, Dr. Dagma.